Thank you. Uh, first, everyone smile. We are being filmed. Uh, in the Aquavita project that many of you have heard about, uh, we are doing uh, investigation of lots of stuff relating to aquaculture, in particular low trophic aquaculture, and we're filming some of our presentations uh, here at this conference. And if you're absolutely fascinated by it and want to see it again, you can probably go to the Aquavita website at some later stage. In the last, uh, yesterday and today, we've seen, the we've seen many presentations that generate data. Most of them are upstream. I, we will now move more downstream towards the consumer uh, and the traceability system. But with that said, uh, it's becoming more and more common for the downstream traceability system that goes to the consumer to actually to link to many of these interesting data elements that are generated upstream. My objective here is to answer this question. Uh, should traceability systems be based on blockchain technology? And to answer that, I need to briefly recap what a traceability system is, or rather what the components of a traceability system are. We need to say a few words about blockchain technology and what that is. And then finally, I will try to answer uh, this, the question, which is the name of the presentation, whether it's relevant to base aquaculture uh, traceability systems on blockchain technology. So let's start with the traceability system. Basically, the first thing you need to do when you have a product traceability system, you need to identify the unit. TRU is uh, an abbreviation that we normally use. It means traceable resource unit. It's general, it means whatever it is, the thing that you are meaning to trace. We know in the aquaculture industry, depending on where, whether we're tracing to uh, business to business or to consumer, we can have labels with barcodes, we can have uh, RFID chips in business to business, we can have QR codes normally when we, when we, uh, uh, normally when we talk to or give information to the consumer. So that's where we start. We, we need to establish a link between the physical world, where the fish is or the product, and the virtual world where the data is. So that's the, that's the first part. That is the starting part of any traceability system. We uh, need to do things like establish uh, code type and structure, uniqueness and granularity, and we need some means of physically associating this identifier to the unit we're tracing. Fine, we've done that. Now, the next thing we look at in the traceability system is what's called transformations, because uh, food chains in general and seafood chains in particular are characterized by a large number of transitions, a very complicated supply chain with lots of transformations, with fish being uh, joined up and split together, or not only fish but ingredients and feed and all the other stuff, it's being joined up and split together and joined up and split together and so you get quite complicated trees. If you've ever looked at an industrial traceability system, it normally has the functionality to visualize for you a traceability tree. And what I've shown you here is a very small, uh, a very small excerpt of, of that tree. It just shows the, all the joining and splitting that's going on, all the transformations that happen. And that is fundamental. That is really, that is really the challenge with traceability of food and especially of food from aquaculture to keep track of all the transformations that happen in the chain. And that means that we need to record them, uh, we need to do weights and percentages, we need to record some metadata with respect to when does it happen, where does it happen, uh, under what conditions, and so on. So now we've sort of built an infrastructure that we can, can collect, uh, connect data to. So now we get to the actual attributes, and those are basically anything. It's an overwhelmingly long, li long list of information that we can attach to this infrastructure we've just established. I've just shown you the first page or so. Uh, there is an ISO standard for uh, naming data elements in aquaculture. It's called ISO 12877, and I've just shown you the first page or so of that. But that standard is open, and practically any of the data that we've seen presented uh, in uh, here in session today and yesterday could be attached to this. If you really wanted, you could, uh, you could let the consumer 
uh, have access to the ROV, ROV da data generated in the cage where the fish was raised. I don't know if you really want to do that, but it's certainly technically possible. So now we have our three components. So basically, and I'm going to go get back to this. So when we're talking about traceability system, we need to identify the data, we need to record transformations, and then we have an infrastructure that we can attach as much data as we like to. Fine. Blockchain. It's hardly possible to move about in the food industry and in the aquaculture industry without reading some uh, articles about implementation based on blockchain technology. And just a Google search will give you basically weekly updates on this. Uh, blockchain originates uh, in September 2008. We had the big financial crisis. And not coincidentally, one month later, a paper called on Bitcoin, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system was published. And I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin here, but Bitcoin is built on a technology which is called blockchain. And so forget about Bitcoin. And we're not talking about enormous energy use and fluctuating uh, currency demands and stuff like that. We're talking about the underlying technology because that has turned out to have some really nice applications in completely different areas. But it was first specified in 2008 by a person who called himself Satoshi Nakamoto, who doesn't exist, but he's a multimillionaire in Bitcoins. So I don't know if he's about to come forward. Now, a challenge with blockchain, especially the last few years, is that you get trade articles like this. These are direct quotes from trade articles. So it's estimated that one in 10 food products are adulterated or mislabeled. With blockchain, you could easily identify tampered products. Wow, fantastic. Uh, Walmart had a trial of blockchain and the report said it took 2.2 seconds to trace using blockchain. In, uh, otherwise, it would have taken six days, 18 hours. You should get suspicious of this, and rightly so. This is total bullshit. This, is, <laughs> this absolutely has nothing to do. Stories like this are undermining the relevance of blockchain because they simply are not true. For instance, the speed one, as we will look very briefly at, blockchain is slower than existing systems. What they're doing here is they're comparing an electronic system to a manual system. So let's look at what blockchain actually is then. It's an incorruptible digital ledger of transactions, any transactions, that can be, that can be uh, programmed to record basically anything. So typically and traditionally, it's financial trans transactions, moving money from one place to another. I don't, in a 15-minute presentation, to have, uh, I can't go into a lot of technical detail, so maybe I'll use this one slide to sort of summarize what block blockchain is. If you're not an expert in this field, it might be good that whenever you hear the word blockchain, you substitute in your mind database, because that's all it is. It's a special way of storing data. It can be stored any data, it's just stored in a very special way. When I say special way, it's online firstly, it's not on your own computer, it, it's online, it has many users. It is distributed, so there are many copies that needs to be synchronized. Uh, it's synchronized, well, you can sort of decide with respect to the public blockchains, they're normally synchronized every 10 minutes. So there's a large operation going on to make sure that all the all the multiple versions of the data uh, in these all these different copies, they are uh, synchronized every 10 minutes. And maybe the most important characteristic of this database is it's encrypted and it's immutable. And that's a very important word, immutable. It means cannot be changed, cannot be overwritten. Okay, let's see how that helps us. So blockchain is an online virtual construct, whereas we live in the aquaculture, maybe this is not the best illustration, that I don't know about a tractor and does an aquaculture, but it's at least an illustration of a physical world. And what we have is, as always, the challenge is getting data from the physical world and into the virtual world. And that is, that is always the challenge. Because blockchain doesn't solve the garbage in, garbage out challenge. It, it still remains. There's no guarantee that data recorded in using blockchain technology are any more accurate than regular data. But there are some advantages. And let's go back to the traceability system. 
Does blockchain technology help us with identification of units? No, it doesn't. Uh, it's, we need to do identification in the same way. We need to do, uh, need to do RFID chips or uh, labels or QR codes or whatever. That, that is unchanged because that's the link between the physical system and the virtual system. Does it help us with the attributes? There's a long list of uh, data elements. Well, not really, not directly. But as we will very briefly see, uh, blockchain can help make data more interoperable. It, it can be helpful when it comes to joining data from different sources. And that gives us sort of an extra means of verification for some of the data elements. But that's not really the main selling point of, of blockchain. The main selling point of the blockchain is the, document, is the, the transformations. Because as I indicated, blockchain was designed to record transactions. And they are very similarly structured to the transformations that we have in the food chain. So that means that inherently in a system that records transactions in our, uh, uh, for us transformations, that is a very well structured, that's a database that is well structured for our purpose. It's much better than a database that records state values or, or things like that. So yes, there is, there is a good match on that. It's, it's, uh, in a blockchain system, not only, let's say you had a blockchain system for your bank account, uh, it would not record, uh, it would not, not record the, the current balance for you in your bank account. Current balance, thousand euros. No, what it would record would be all the hundreds of transactions that ever happened from first you opened your account, okay, your salary, 500 euros, spent 100 euros in 500, and so on. All these up and down uh, transactions would be recorded, and finally the balance would be calculated as a result of all of these. It, this tells you two things. It is slow, it takes a lot longer time, it takes a lot of space, uh, but it's very transparent. It's, it, it, it's, it, it doesn't just make a claim saying this is your current balance. It says, well, we've calculated the current balance based on all these transactions that have been recorded and are immutable. They haven't been fiddled with. So that's the reason why we make this following claim. So it's more transparent. So this is, I, I post the, the presentation as a yes, no question. Should we base traceability systems in the aquaculture in industry and blockchain? And I can't clearly answer yes or no. We have to break it down slightly into a few categories. What about data quality and veracity? Does blockchain offer an advantage? Yes, it does. Because we know that the data hasn't been changed. That's not something we know in a regular database. And we know who added the data because of this encryption thing. What about trust and transparency? Does blockchain offer an advantage? Yes, it does. Uh, but to some degree, this depends on the trust on who owns the blockchain. For Bitcoin, we have public chains. That is not very likely to be the solution that you would go for in the aquaculture industry. You would more likely have so-called federated chains, which have owners. So the trust would really depend on to what degree you trusted the owners of the blockchain. What about data confidentiality? Ability to provide tiered data access? No. I mean, you can... Uh, make functionality for that with blockchain also, but that's not what blockchain was built for. Blockchain was built as a public system with access for all, and you sort of, you have to fiddle with it to restrict access. So that's not inherently what you want blockchain for. What about performance and efficiency? No, clearly not. Uh, it, blockchain uses a lot more space, and it does all the calculations to, to calculate the current balance rather than, than just looking up a number. How about robustness and fault tolerance? Well, because of the replication, all these databases we talked about, it's very robust. But to be quite, to be quite honest, we can easily achieve that in a regular database as well. But the final, um, the final point here is probably my main reason for actually recommending blockchain. Uh, interoperability. It's so much easier to integrate data if everyone is using blockchain. All the data by nature refer to the transformations. And it's a lot easier to integrate data than 
if you try to integrate data now in current systems stored in Excel sheets, uh, stored in relational database, and so on. So blockchain, the, the uniformity that you would achieve by using blockchain uh, makes data much more interoperable. So summary, it's an exciting technology. Uh, solution providers are currently overselling uh, what it can be used for. Confidentiality and speed can be a challenge, uh, but for traceability, it actually will solve some problems that I just mentioned. This was the 15-minute version. There's actually a, a report. I'm from Nofim. I don't think I mentioned that. It's the Norwegian Institute for, for Food Research, and we made a report on this, and we're doing quite a lot of blockchain work. If you're from uh, one of the countries high up in Europe, we're doing a blockchain in the seafood industry workshop on the 24th and 25th of November. If you're interested, please contact me. Thank you for your attention. So the uh, advantages in general of food traceability is over uh, in detail. Um, can you talk about the specifics for the agriculture industry, how a robust traceability system uh, provides value, and in terms of an ideal system, what information would be? Yeah. Um, for aquaculture, I would say the particularity is then um, it's becoming more and more relevant to do uh, carbon footprint calculations and so on. And I think, as far as I remember, something like 70% of the carbon footprint of aquaculture is from the feed. So that means that something that happens quite uh, far up in the chain, long before you get to the consumer, uh, has really decides 80% of the carbon footprint. So that means that you need a sort of a longer and more connected traceability system, not only to the feed, but also to the feed ingredients and the feed producer. So the biggest challenge and, and the thing we have companies that were working with just as, at this moment who are coming to us and saying, uh, we're selling, we're selling uh, aquaculture products to consumers. We want more accurate calculation of carbon footprint. We want a traceability system to integrate more closely with the feed producers and, and uh, to get the sustainability information from there. That, I would say that is probably the biggest particularity, the, the, the thing that is special for the aquaculture industry makes, makes it different, different from many other industries. industries. And uh, just related to that, I mean, you talk about interoperability and what it requires really is interoperability that it goes far beyond aquaculture. So that connects feeds and connects supply chains. Okay, yeah. How close or how achievable is that? Well, interoperability, I mean more width than depth. By interoperability, the supermarkets who are getting a lot of information, they, they're buying products from maybe five or 10,000 suppliers. And, and they're asking for data or they have requirements put in the contract for recording data. And this data is sent to them, but it's sent to them in five or 10,000 different formats. And they're saying the work of integrating all this data to sort of to harmonize. If you can imagine, technically, it's completely possible for you to buy something in the supermarket with, say, a QR code in it, scan it, get to the supermarket page, and get comparable information presented in the same way, regardless of who the actual supplier was. But that requires integration of data. Then all this data in all these formats need to be harmonized and put into the same system. That's the integration process I'm talking about. That is insurmountable now, or not insurmountable, but they don't feel they make money, enough money on it to actually do it. But if the data out there was already in blockchain, then you could automate this process far more easily. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Excellent. Uh, how have you talked with the um, our regulators or, for example, certification schemes that could be using this information as well? For yeah, uh, it's. Um uh, I, we worked with traceability for a long time, at least 25 years, and, and I think I, I, I can roughly say that there are maybe three groups of, of comp or, or very broadly uh, speaking, there are three groups of companies. There are the companies who where legislation is the main driver. 
There, is, there are traceability requirements in, in, uh, in legislation. We want to make sure we always live up to those. Uh, and that's the minimum requirement always. Then you have, you have the big bulk in the middle who are mm, a bit more proactive and are interested in more data to do industrial statistics and, uh, and uh, benchmarking and so on. They don't profile themselves with, uh, they don't profile themselves as a traceability company, but they need it for their own purposes. But for purposes like this, it's most interesting to work with the third group, the first movers, the ones who are actively using traceability or access to information as a competitive advantage. They go into the market and they say, okay, one of the most important ways for us to add value is to do storytelling, to tell you about provenance, to show you the fish, the fish farm, to maybe show you some videos from the fish farm that actually the fish was in the cage, to show you sustainability of feed and so on. So with the legislators, they're mostly relevant for the first group. And in research, we work less with them and more with the, the first movers. And they are way beyond legislation already because they over or already overfulfill the requirements in legislation. Yep.